We are going to go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for coming and joining us for HBCU Stronger. I, I hope y'all do a little better than that for our guests, but with that, I'm going to bring up Miss Ebony Thomas for our opening remarks. start over. I'm a former teacher, so that's not how we're going to do this. Good afternoon, everyone. I love it. All this, hopefully, HBCU love that's in the building. So thank you, Taylor. I appreciate the, the introduction and completely honored, humbled, privileged to be here today uh, to just kick us off um, and completely honored to represent my teammates at Bank of America. Um, I'm also a proud graduate. I am from North Carolina a and State University in Greensboro, North Carolina. <laughs> and I have the privilege of leading work at Bank of America that really supports um, communities and particularly communities of color. And it has been my absolute dream um, to be in a place filled with so many distinguished presidents and individuals who have the same deep love and admiration that I have for HBCUs. So my love goes deep. I'm a legacy of an HBCU. I'm also produced a legacy of HBCU. So my perspective comes from someone who is, again, a graduate, as well as someone who is committed to its future sustainability. An, HB, an HBCU education is by no means the only path to success. For me, it has been the only path to success. HBCUs are the engines driving so much work. They are the centers of thought leadership and innovation and all that is widely shared within our community. When it comes to priorities like building wealth through entrepreneurship, stable careers, assessing, uh, accessing higher education, general wealth transfer, and increased longevity, HBCUs are at the forefront of these efforts, working to empower the next generation of graduates as they enter the workforce. Bank of America is proud of the work that we do to support that. For example, our Way Forward initiative partners with HBCUs with educational consultation firm EAB to help the schools set strategic priorities and establish a work toward financial stability goals as they continue to be strong cornerstones that they are. And in the support of the students, we've established strategic partnerships with over 64 HBCUs to address skill gaps so that students of color are prepared for high paying fa family sustaining jobs. Our 25 million jobs initiative is built around three pillars creating pathways for students of color, supporting community colleges and HBCUs and, HBC and Hispanic serving institutions, and connecting students with employers once they graduate. We support all HBCUs, big, small, private, public, urban, or rural. We have a relationship and a partnership with all of them. At Bank of America, we hold ourselves accountable for increasing diversity representation by disclosing our employee employment metrics, measuring progress atop, across top management levels, and building a robust pipeline of emerging talent through recruitment and partnerships across campuses. Our workforce is 50% women and 49% people of color, reflecting the clients and the communities that we live and we work. For over 200 years, the importance, uh, the importance of access to higher education in the black community has been demonstrated time and time again. Today, tomorrow, and yesterday, HBCUs across the nation have been and will continue to educate teachers, ministers, doctors, lawyers, and yes, bankers, who will help shape American life for years to come. We recognize the importance of their mission, not only in the black community, but also for the advancement of equality in society as a whole. 
and are proud to partner with HBCUs nationwide and support African American educational excellence and economic empowerment. It is now my honor and privilege to introduce Representative Alma Adams, who is also a graduate of the greatest institution ever, North Carolina a and and also of SOA. First elected to Congress in 2014, Congressman Adams is serving her fourth term as the elected representative for my district, North Carolina's 12th congressional district, which includes Charlotte and surrounding Mecklenburg County. In the House of Representatives, she serves on the House Committee, Committee of Financial Services and is the Vice Chair of House Committee on Agriculture. She is also Chairwoman of the Committee on Education and Labor Subcommittee on Workforce Protection. She is the recipient of numerous awards and honors, including the North Carolina a State University Human Rights Medal, the highest award presented by our alma mater to an individual who fights against social injustice and help improve the world. In 2017, Congresswoman Adams founded the Congressional Bipartisan HBCU Caucus, on which she serves still as co-chair. For her steadfast commitment and work on HBCU-centered policies, she is affectionately known as the godmother, godmother of HBCUs. For Congresswoman Adams, there are four necessities that all people require to live a quality life. Affordable and accessible health care, access to healthy and nutritious food, fair and affordable housing, and a, and, and a quality first class education. These essentials, which she calls the four H's, should not be political issues. They should be rights guaranteed to all people. Please join me in a warm welcome for Congresswoman Adams. Thank you, Ebony. Good evening, everyone. Oh, is anybody out there? Good evening. All right, we are HBCU Strong. I'm so happy to be here. And uh, now that is some HBCU spirit. Thank you all. Uh, we are HBCU Strong. I, I do want to thank all of you for joining us this evening for the annual HBCU B Brain Trust at the Congressional B uh, Black Caucuses Foundation's 51st Annual Legislative Conference. I am Alma Adams, and I am proud to be HBCU Strong. You know, as a two-time HBCU graduate, as a former HBCU professor, uh, gathering with our HBCU community refreshes and uplifts my soul. And that's the power of our schools, institutions of higher education that were founded because no one else would educate folk who look like you and me. And so our grandparents and our great-grandparents said, we'll do it ourselves. And yes, indeed, they did, and we are still here. You know, there's something special in a community like ours, something that you find very rarely in our life, and it's something worth protecting, worth fighting for, and worth investing in. And that's why I first of all want to thank all of our partners today for this dynamic discussion that we're going to get into momentarily. ECMC, Delta Airlines, Bank of America, Accenture, McDonald's, Apple, and IBM, thank you all for your steadfast support for our HBCUs and for joining us today for this panel discussion. I also want to recognize Dr. Dietrich Trent, who is the new executive director the White House Initiative on HBCUs. You know, I want to thank our esteemed panel of HBCU presidents, uh, services, indeed the rent we pay uh, for living on this earth. Thank you for all of the rent that you pay forward, keeping your rent paid up to help our students and our campuses. To Dr. Rosalind Clark Artis of Benedict College, Dr. Makola Abdullah of Virginia State University, Dr. Daniel Wims of Atlanta, uh, Alabama Agricultural and, and Mechanical University, my soror, Dr. Glenda Glover, Tennessee State, 
and Dr. Suzanne Elise Walsh from my very own Bennett College, who uh, still pays my retirement for the 40 years that I labored there with love. Thank you so much all for being here. I do want to commend you all for your work in keeping our students going, especially during these difficult times when our HBCUs are emerging and, and they're recovering from a health pandemic while actively navigating this year's unfortunate bomb threat. And to our audience, thank you all for joining us today. You know, as I considered the theme for this year's HBCU Brain Plus, it wasn't hard to settle on a topic, HBCU Stronger. I also want to mention that I think I have some former students out here uh, who, who, who came up and spoke to me, and I'll tell you, uh, she said, you know, I didn't know if you were gonna be here or not. I didn't see your name anywhere. And I said, well, this is my event, so of course I was gonna be here. <laughs> but let me just say, because over the nearly 200 years, 200 years almost, our schools have shown once and once again just how strong we really are. In March of 2020, our nation began grappling with the coronavirus. Uh, and much of us went into quarantine. Businesses closed, some permanently, and lives were lost. Our HBCUs, though, transformed to, to meet the needs of the moment. From brick and mortar campuses to, to digital learning centers, from classrooms to virtual academic networks, and from academic institutions to accessible incubators for students, able to, to meet students wherever a computer, a cell phone, or a tablet would take them. The strength of our schools was evident then. It's always our schools, they've always been evident. But new, the new challenge was brewing. As early as December of 2021, HBCUs and, and their faculty started receiving disgusting, hate-filled bomb threats. And by February of 2022, almost 60 bomb threats had been made against our schools. And as a member of the Congressional Black Caucus and the founder and co-chair of the bipartisan HBCU caucus, we quickly coordinated members of Congress representing HBCUs as well as other HBCU allies to condemn the, the, condemn the threat and to ensure that the federal investigation was carefully and thoroughly pursued. But still our schools endured. Why? Because they are HBCU strong. And so, as the godmother, some call me, of an HBCU student uh, that strengthened the strength of our students and of our school leaders and our community, is certainly not lost to me. And finally, our theme was inspired by the determination of HBCUs to consistently go above and beyond. And that's because our schools have a demonstrated history of doing more and doing better with less resources than their institutional peers. So, you know, when folk continue to ask, uh, why do we need HBCUs? Do we still need HBCUs? And I just tell them, what in the hell would we do without our HBCUs? <laughs> you know, some in this room uh, may know, and if you don't know, you'll learn throughout today's session, that in 2021, I came together as the founder of the HBCU caucus with my fellow caucus co-chairs, Representative French Hill, uh, a, a Republican sen from, from uh, Arkansas, uh, Senators Tim Scott and Chris Coons to introduce H.R. 3294, the Ignite HBCU Excellence Act. And this bill would authorize new funding for, for the literal foundation of many HBCUs by providing federal grant funding for campus infrastructure. Our schools have endured so much, so, so much. And so I believe we have a duty to make sure that we make sure that our schools stay strong for, for generations to come. And I say we just don't want to survive, to, to, thr to survive, we want to thrive. And so today it brings me great pleasure to welcome all of you to the fifth annual HBCU Brain Trust and to explore this year's theme, HBCU Stronger. And now it is my pleasure to introduce the moderator for our president's panel, a two, two soon to be three-time HBCU graduate, 
uh, Ms. Denise A. Smith. Denise is, is a senior fellow of higher education at the Century Foundation. Her work studies educational equity, the financing of HBCUs, and, and the role of government funding in empowering these institutions and their students' success. Her report, Achieving Financial Equity and Justice for HBCUs, shed student engagement and college activism at the Truth Initiative, where she oversaw the college program, student engagement program, working with over 200 minority-serving institutions, HBCUs, and community colleges, providing technical assistance and strategic direction to achieve policy change. And I just want to take a, a special privilege here and say that I was one of the founding members of that Truth Initiative when it was uh, started probably more than 20 years ago. But additionally, she's completing her PhD in higher education, leadership, and policy studies at Howard University, HU. You know? Yeah, my grandson's there, so he taught me uh, to say that. Even though he didn't want to be, as long as you go to an HBCU, Nana's money will follow you. So we've got our fingers crossed that he's going to be getting out this year. But thank you again for joining us today. God bless you. And Ms. Smith, come on, take it away. Okay, did I get everybody's attention? Okay. Thank you, woman, uh, Congresswoman Alma Adams, for that introduction and the opportunity to uh, moderate this panel this afternoon. I hope everybody's doing well. Um, to kick us off, I would like to introduce our esteemed panelists, and if you guys could come up as I introduce you. Um, Dr. Makola Abdullah, President of Virginia State University. Dr. Rosalind Clark Artis, president of Benedict College. Dr. Daniel Weems, president of Alabama A&M University. Mrs. Suzanne Walsh, president of Bennett College. and Dr. Glenda Glover, president of Tennessee State University. She's also the immediate past president of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated and the co-chair of President Biden's HBCU Advisory Board. Thank you all for joining us for this amazing conversation this afternoon. I'm really excited um, to hear from you and to be in this space after being in a pandemic for two years, it's nice to be in person. And so I just would be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about what the last two years have been like. Um, when I think about the challenges um, that HBCUs have experienced over the last few years between the pandemic and the challenges with broadband access, uh, infrastructure, but I would also be remiss because I know um, President Weems, you've had some challenges with experiencing bomb threats. If you each could just take about one to two minutes just to talk a little bit about those challenges, but how you all are overcoming them. Well, relative to the bomb threats, we uh, are in the city of Huntsville. And as you know, the city of Huntsville, uh, in the city of Huntsville, we have the material command for the United States Army. We have uh, NASA headquarters. We have uh, missile defense. Missile Command, and about 300 defense contractors. It's the second most hacked city in the country. 
So as a result, those kind of threats, they have apparatus to kind of mitigate it. So we don't manage with a scalp or with a brick, we manage with a scalpel. So what we were able to do was mitigate that threat very quickly. But we have students who are from Detroit, from Chicago, from St. Louis, and from rural areas in the state of Alabama. And as a result, they were kind of shaken. So we had to do some counseling and some, some mental health initiatives to help them get over that because they were not accustomed to that. But for us, it wasn't a, a bigger threat as some other institutions who may not have had the, the um, interaction with the city and the county as well as our military and defense uh, partners. And so we were able to really look very closely and, and isolate what a threat was supposed to have been. Now, the challenge, though, is that we sit in Mo Brooks District. Y'all don't know who Mo Brooks is? And we have uh, a great deal of support for Mr. Trump in our area. It was a stronghold for him. And so as a result, uh, we anticipate that some of those types of threats will continue. So what we've had to do is ramp up and increase our expertise and information sharing with our campus police and our partners at the Sheriff's Office and Police Chief. Well, I think uh, at Virginia State, in the latest round of bomb threats, we were not a part of that. Our sister institutions, Virginia Union and Norfolk State, did suffer bomb threats. Uh, but I think many people, well, folks who are in HBCUs would not be surprised, but many people would be surprised that over the past seven years that I've been president, we've had three bomb threats at Virginia State. And most of us have had bomb threats quite a bit farther back than the current stories that exist. Uh, and one of the things that I continue to tell my students is that it's important for them to understand that the fact that someone would call in a bomb threat at an HBCU where they have an opportunity to get an education shows how valuable other people think of the education that they're getting at their institution because they want to stop them from getting it. And so they should treat it with the same kind of value that those who wish to bomb our institutions have. They should take advantage of the opportunity and make sure that they continue to fight for their education. Thank you for that. Any other comments? You know, I, I really love uh, Dr. Abdullah's analysis there, and I think it speaks volumes about how we teach at historically black colleges, how we have leveraged negativity to create a positive learning experience for all of our students. Uh, we likewise were not the victim of bomb threats in this round. I, like my colleague, have certainly endured them, particularly at a prior institution. Um, but the heightened sense of awareness and readiness that has to happen on our campus is when you are living in an environment where those threats are a day-to-day -day reality really creates um, a sense of um, clarity around mission, very clear ideas about the value of education and safety in general. We have a slight advantage. We are a small private institution with a closed campus and our own police department. And so as we began to gain intel throughout the bomb threats that we were seeing in our sister institutions, in many instances, the callers referenced um, the shooting in South Carolina the nine innocent people that died in Mother Emanuel Church in South Carolina. So we had a very heightened sense of awareness and connectivity to that, assuming that because of that reference, we could be a very likely target. And so really fortified our campus community, educated and engaged our students, worked collaboratively with our police department, and really deepened the connections and the ties that we have when it comes to emergency response. So I think that we can take nothing for granted. Um, Always at our institutions, we always do more with less. And in this instance, we leverage negativity to create a positive momentum on our campuses. I really like um, what President Artis said about it, it really helps you hone in on your mission. So we don't have walls at Bennett. I mean, you can just sort of you can walk on. We're very open campus, and we chose to say we're going to remain open. You know, we're not going to put up walls. You could think about putting up fences. Uh, we did take advantage of the opportunities that um, Homeland Security made available where we had visits to help us fortify um, all of our security. So they've come, they've visited, they've looked at our buildings, helped us to really rethink our security. How can we beef it up so that we can be resilient? Uh, but we took a more proactive approach. And I, I love that point. I think it really helped us to say we could do lots of things that would keep people out. And we said, no, we don't want to do that. We have to be here for, our, for the community. 
Thank you. And I would only briefly add that while Tennessee State University did not receive a direct bomb threat, if they threaten Alabama State, if they threaten Howard, if they threaten Jackson State, they threaten Tennessee State. Because they threaten one of us, they threaten us all. Because what affects one directly affects us all indirectly. So we expect uh, those who uh, have no sense of purpose to come after HBCUs, because we're doing a great job. We're in the middle of an HBCU renaissance. <laughs> and as such, we expect this to come. We, the COVID didn't take us out, now they'll try bomb threats. So what's next? So we just stay prepared and ready. We stay prayed up and we're ready for whatever comes our way. Thank you all so much for, for sharing that. I, I want to talk a little bit about um, the impact of underfunding and what it looks like on infrastructure challenges at institutions. I know that there have been a lot of capital campaigns and a lot of great philanthropic gifts, uh, but it seems like there's still a lot that can be done to really help support the real, true investments in HBCU infrastructure. Uh, in 2018, the Governmental um, Accountability Office did an assessment of all 101 HBCUs, and they found out that 46% of HBCU buildings were in need of repair or replacement. Now, with that report, they pulled out three major things that needed to be addressed. You need to really focus on um, deferred backlog maintenance on these um, buildings. They needed to also make sure that the institution's buildings were up to code when it comes to um, competitiveness against other institutions and also ensuring that they are able to hold on to historic preservations and maintain those buildings. Um, Congresswoman Alma Adams has proposed the HBCU Ignite Act, which could be an, a bill that could provide infrastructure grants to HBCUs. Could you guys take a little bit of time just to talk a little bit about what that would mean to be able to access that grant for your institution? Well, the IGNITE Act is probably one of the most fascinating and necessary bills that have come to, the, well, that has come up that I can recall. It's even more significant to me than the CARES Act funding because that was more of an emergency basis. This really shows that the infrastructure problem has to be dealt with. And why it's being held up is beyond me. Well, I guess we do know the reason, but, but why it's being held up on a broader scale, it's just, it's just unacceptable. So I think as, as HBCU presidents, we must do all we can to push that. We have to write, we have to write uh, letters to the editor, open letters, do whatever it takes to get Ignite passed, because it would be beneficial. Yes. We have buildings that, uh, you know, for HBCU, most of our buildings, a lot of our buildings are 100 years old when <laughs> we got started. We still have those on campus. Those, that type of infrastructure doesn't lend itself to the proper learning environment for students. Now, some of us have, have done some things to, to keep it going. We've done everything to make sure we can still survive and thrive. However, uh, with Ignite, it would take us to a different sphere because the infrastructure includes technology, and then once you get technology in it, you can, that becomes academic infrastructure. So it's also important for the growth and development of HBCUs. Well, we'd like to thank Congresswoman Adams for her championing this. Uh, and because of that, <laughs> we can give her a round of applause. Uh, Alabama Agricultural Mechanical University gave her an honorary doctorate in 2021, and she is so deserving, having spent 40 years teaching in HBCUs and, and leading an effort for HBCUs in the Congress. But we see this as an issue of justice, particularly in states like Alabama and South Carolina that are not as wealthy as states like Virginia, Dr. McCullough. <laughs> and so uh, for us, to be honest with you, our last new capital project was in the mid to late 90s, and that came out of a consent decree decision and lawsuit. It wasn't until 2021 and two that we built new buildings on our campus, and we had to use capital access, the bond initiative to get those buildings because we are not getting state funding. And what you have to understand, in some of our states, the non-flagship TWIs have grown exponentially on the, black, on the back of black student enrollment. 
particularly in states like Georgia, where you have Kennesaw State, Georgia State, Valdosta State, Georgia Southwestern, Georgia Southern, who are now desegregated because some of those institutions have over two of them. Georgia State is 60% minority enrollment, if I'm not mistaken. Kennesaw State is majority black. So what happens to Fort Valley, Savannah, and Albany? In Alabama, we've got Jacksonville State and University of West Alabama and South Alabama that are all competing for us for our market share. Traditionally, white institutions know that their growth depends upon those high school graduates from our traditionally and majority minority communities. So the reason they're able to grow is because they have better dormitories. They got better science buildings. They got better academic units and more technology than we have because the states have not invested in our institutions at the same level that they've invested in theirs. There are various reasons, and we could talk about who's in the state legislature, who sits in the governor's office, but the bottom line is we feel from a justice perspective that for decades we've been unfairly treated. And so we have to support Congresswoman Adams and her efforts because if we don't get it from the federal side, it is very, very difficult for us to get it from the state side. Try impossible. <laughs> I'm a small, private, historically black college. There is no state fund. Uh, I am a Baptist affiliated institution. I depend on the building fund in the churches to support us. And so Ignite is particularly important to our small private HBCU counterparts because we have not had a history at all of state funding, even in a highly funded or an underfunded, we got no funding. <laughs> so um, we really have to be thoughtful about advocating not just for Ignite to move, but to move at a level that is consistent with and reflective of the needs of historically black colleges. We have five historic buildings on our campus. That is a beautiful thing. Yesterday, we had an opportunity to host the Secretary of Interior on our campus and tour our five buildings. That is historic, and we're so proud, and they're so raggedy, and they're so old, right? So there is this interesting juxtaposition between history, and I just got a lot of old stuff on my campus. And when you start peeling back the layers, you learn that you've got to bring up your wiring. You've got to bring up your technology. You've got to bring up your HVAC. So as generous as those programs have been of late in helping us to update the infrastructure for historic preservation buildings, a slate roof is three times a shingle roof in terms of cost. Those buildings were not built with air conditioning. Our ancestors didn't have central air, ladies and gentlemen. So when you have to go back and retrofit a building while maintaining the historic integrity of the building, the cost is quite high. This, the IGNITE Act is critically important to help us with the other buildings that are not historic but equally deprived. If a building was built in the 40s, 50s, or 60s on our campuses, they are retrofit for purposes of technology, HVAC and other amenities. It takes a lot to keep those buildings in shape. And our institutions have been starved for resources for generations. Our children deserve the very same resources that children enrolled in predominantly white institutions, public or private, enjoy. We are not being spoiled, we are not being selfish, we are not being petty when we demand the same kinds of resources, facilities, laboratories, and research spaces as our counterpart institutions, because our kids deserve it. And we have to advocate for this act. Uh, I, I wanna make sure, like my colleagues, that I, that I thank um, Congresswoman Alma Adams for being a champion uh, for infrastructure for HBCUs. Um, I would be remiss though if I didn't thank some other champions who also happen to be in the room. Uh, first, Congressman Bobby Scott, who's been an incredible champion for, for HBCUs, particularly Virginia HBCUs. Um, and our current director of White House Initiative, Dietrich Trent, who in her role as Secretary of Education in Virginia is also a champion for HBCUs. And so, and so when my colleagues talk about how well-funded we are, uh, it's because um, we have had uh, uh, consistent champions to make that happen, including uh, Congressman uh, uh, Donald McEachin also. Um, but, and, and also wanted to congratulate you on, you, on your work on endowments, uh, because I think it's important as we talk about infrastructure that we talk about all of it, right? Thank that you. it's the physical infrastructure, we've talked about our buildings and, and what that is. We, 
we talk about our endowments and our endowments are, are undersized compared to institutions that have, that are, have been along the same amount of time. Uh, we talk about our technology infrastructure uh, and what it takes to move our in institutions uh, and grow our technology infrastructure. And so bringing light to the challenges that we face in infrastructure are important because the underfunding that has happened, we, it's not measured in dollars. It's measured in the, in the lack of individuals who are here to perform the kind of jobs that we know that they could do. The fact that we have an African-American woman now who is a graduate of an HBCU, who is a vice president of the United States, the question really is, who would have been the one before her? Right? If our institutions are graduating 10,000 now, could they have the infrastructure to graduate 20,000? For our niche institutions who are smaller and private and want to be small, um, what would happen if they had the PhD programs to exist with the programs that they have now to graduate those professionals? Uh, and so the underfunding has really turned into an undercapitalization of talent in our community, and we need to address it. Well, I. Uh... Yeah, I, I want to hear from you, Dr. Walsh, about, you know, as a president of a private institution, I know that you have different challenges when it comes to making sure that you have funding for the Bennett Bells. And so I'm curious about what are the trade-offs that you have to make to ensure that you would, uh, are funding your institutions and, and uh, adjusting to the disparities in funding. Well, I love that I love that you asked about the trade-offs because that's what it is. I mean, every day, especially those of us who are private institutions and smaller ones, we every day is a trade-off. So CARES Act money was incredible because then at least I, I didn't, I think President R is probably the same. I didn't have to choose between are we gonna fix the boiler or are we gonna get the vaccine? Are we going you know, there are there are a set of choices that are real, you know, and are we gonna pay for more scholarships for students? or are we gonna buy masks? Like it was just, it sounds like those things don't belong together, but those are the choices you have to make in an emergency. Um, when it comes to Ignite, because this is another set of trade-offs, we've been amazing at the deferred part of deferred maintenance. We have deferred and deferred and deferred. Because again, it's a trade-off. Not because we wanted to do that, but we also want to fund students, we want to support faculty, staff, and so forth. And so I want to give just a couple of quick examples of what happens when you don't have that infrastructure and, and what happens to talent. Um, we had a faculty member in biology who received an NSF grant, so a lot of the other things we hear about is, let's make sure that HBCUs are competitive for the federal grants. Great. But if we don't deal with the infrastructure, it doesn't matter. So this faculty member in biology received an NSF grant, could not finish her research because her samples were being contaminated by the mold spores in the air, in the lab. So we have to really look at those investments that can allow us to upgrade. We're competitive, we're competitive now in a moldy lab. So imagine what would happen if we had up-to-date facilities. And again, those are the, there are certain trade-offs. So right now, we also make trade-offs when we think about which of the buildings are we going to work on? We finally have come to a place where we're not as heavy on the deferred part of deferred maintenance, but it's been very difficult to get, making a set of choices. Making a set of choices to say we're gonna focus on one building at a time, you can't do them all. And, and what does that mean? If we're gonna focus on that one building, what's the other building that doesn't get focused on? But we wanna make every building a place that is exciting for students to learn in, that's a great place to work, a great place to live, and that really requires an investment that goes beyond what we have access to. So I think that these, these things all tie together, but they allow us to not have to make such dire trade-offs. The, the deferred part of deferred maintenance was because we chose to invest in a student somewhere else. And now we want to be able to invest. Investing in our students means we have to also invest in the, in the facilities in order for them to succeed. Now, I know we've talked a little bit about challenges and we're running out of time, but I do want to talk a little bit about the successes that we've seen. Uh, Dr. Glover, you actually were able to have Dr. Lee put $250 million into his budget for your institution this year. For I mean, I think that that deserves a round of applause. I mean, well, I'm just curious, you. because of the inequities in funding to your land-grant institution, there, what could that do for your institution's infrastructure well, It's an interesting story with Tennessee State. You know, the state of Tennessee and the state of Maryland have two parallel uh, great stories. I focus on Tennessee. Uh, just by way of background, 
Uh, I am a lawyer and I am a CPA. And so one Saturday morning, my vice president of finance and I were going over the financial statements for the audit. And we said, so what is this transfer every year that I see going in, from operations? She said, oh, that's the, we don't get our match from the state of Tennessee. And I said, why not? And I was a very new president, so I had to you know, tread lightly. But I said, uh, this doesn't make any sense. We're taking money out of our operations for, to patch up what should be coming from the state, because there's matching funds. And uh, Dr. Adams knows about this, because she's been the champion for this, Dr. Alma Adams for this for years. Well, you know, when, when land grant institutions don't get a match, they're a state match. So we called a, uh, a, a very astute uh, representative who's a TSU grad who works on, who is respected on both sides of the aisle, Representative Harold Love, and brought his attention, here's what's happened, what can you do to help us? And so one thing led to another, and so they formed a bipartisan council, a committee, which determined, which went back to the 1950s, and so we said it's not good for me to go back and do it, because it wouldn't have the same level of respect and credibility if you did it. Why don't you get your person to do it? So the finance person for the state of Tennessee spearheaded this and from, it found out that Tennessee State University was owed $544 million for, because of unequal funding, a diverted funding, funding that went from Tennessee State, well, the University of Tennessee got their funding, but TSU didn't. So $544 million is quite a lot. So the first part of that we got in this year's budget, so we're using for this fiscal year $250 million. I applaud our governor <laughs> for putting it in his budget for this year, $250 million. Now, it's for infrastructure, the same infrastructure we're talking about now, it's for infrastructure funding. Um, I'm not saying it's for past money owed. I'm saying it's for infrastructure. No, and, it is. Thank you. And that's what we're using. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. <laughs> and, and if I can, I, wanna... I might add that uh, there are three 1890s sitting on the stage, and we all have a similar problem with the one-to-one -one match. Uh, I'm an ad guy, and I know that we didn't start getting research funding in 1890s until the 70s, and then it was paltry. One-to-one -one match, when our one does not match their one. And in their cases, they're getting eight, 10, and 12 to one match, and have been doing it for 100 years. And so we're 100 years behind, and in our case, we're 150 years old, and we got 100 years of deferred maintenance. Uh, we got a historic district that we cannot maintain at the level that we are if we're gonna continue to grow our institutional enrollment. But the bottom line is, uh, we're looking at the differences, and we found that we're old more than what Representative Love said that you're old. And so uh, as a result, uh, we don't know how we're going to approach this, but it becomes a legislative issue. And if we're going to sustain 1890s and be able to do research that we are trying to do, we have to access some of those infrastructure But resources. there are two things that I have to say to other land grant institutions. There are two levels of matching funds. Most of us are going to go after the state money, the state match on the federal level. Somewhere in the enabling legislation, somewhere there is a rule that says how much money each HBCU would get in proportion to another, the other land grant institution in the state. And I was, if TSU got something, University of Tennessee got three times as much. I'm not challenging that right now. I'm challenging the fact that we had gotten zero. So in the 1913 law for the state of Tennessee, it authorized Tennessee State to get one amount and University of Tennessee to get another amount. It takes some digging, it takes some research to go back and look at that law. I can, I can almost guarantee that somewhere in that law there's some amount of money that states should have been getting they have not received. So I challenge each one of you to go back and look that, look that up and start that process of matching that up from year to year. Yeah, that's well, just a state, that's a land yeah, grant. Yeah, every wanna... state was uh, required to uh, send that information to the federal government. And I don't know what year, it was 1913, but every state was required as to how they would divvy it up from the 1862 to the 1890. I don't want to cut us short, but I know we're at time. <laughs> but I think this has been a great, robust conversation that needs to continue. 
Um, we have a lot of uh, people here from corporate partnerships that are here to also talk about uh, infrastructure after this panel. So thank you all so much. We appreciate it. Fantastic. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Dominika Groom Williams, and I have the pleasure of being the Executive Vice President and Chief Diversity Officer at Truist, the bank, and we're excited to be a part of the corporate panel discussion and talking about the work that we are doing to ensure that we remain connected to and investing in the HBCUs. So I'd like to invite all of our corporate, corporate panelists to the stage, if you wouldn't mind. So Chloe uh, from Accenture, we have Corey from Apple, we have Lydia from IBM, and I think it's Suheili, correct me if I'm wrong, from McDonald's. Welcome to the stage. Fantastic. So, ladies, thank you for joining us in this great conversation. That was a tough group to follow, but we'll try to do our best to, to keep up the momentum. So. The purpose of this discussion, for the benefit of the audience, is to really focus on um, the benefit, like I said, of making investments as corporations into campus infrastructure and curriculum modernization at HBCUs um, as it pertains to recruiting diverse talent to corporate America, as well as building new relationships and with the institutions and with the students. So a lot of us are not only focused on that pipeline of talent, but also what we can do as great co corporate citizens and community partners to really drive some of that activity. So with that, we'll dive right into the discussion, and I'd like to ask each one of you to respond to the, our first question, which is talking a little bit about some of the projects that you've done across your respective organizations with HBCUs, um, what needs really fueled that project, and then what resources have been helpful in sustaining the project. So Chloe, I'll start with you. So for Accenture, we're very intentional about our partnerships with HBCUs. We know HBCUs are a source of economic mobility, but also really a source of innovation. And in Atlanta, where I live, there are so many corporations that know this, and they're moving to Atlanta because we have such a large um, concentration of HBCUs. So for us, the intentionality starts at the top. Our CEOs are committed. Um, our objective is to be the most diverse and inclusive firm on the planet. And so to do that, it really means that we've got commitment from the top, but we've also got commitment from our people. And so um, we have so many HBCU graduates at Accenture, and those graduates come together to make sure that we support our people coming in from HBCUs. But in addition to that, we've done projects with HBCUs. We've worked with um, Prairie View, a and so we have a co-op program. We call it Level Up, and it's really giving those students an, an opportunity to spend, a, spend time with the client. We have a capstone project at the end, um, and that's in partnership uh, with Microsoft. So we are really just helping to do our part to diversify the tech pipeline. Um, also with Howard here, um, I'm actually part of the Supply Chain Advisory Board, and so one of the things that we do is um, the co-op program wasn't the best idea for them because students really need to keep in, they need to stay in school and make money while they're in school. So we also provided opportunities for um, partnerships so that they can just um, work with our um, consultants to gain experience while they're still in school. So those are just a few examples. We also have a partnership with um, the Student Freedom Initiative to build um, shared services tech infrastructure. So really collaborating with them because there's really opportunity for the HBCUs to come together and leverage some shared services where there's not enough funding to build their own infrastructure. And those are areas like cybersecurity, um, networking, overall cloud and infrastructure technology. Thank you for sharing that. 
Yeah, at Apple, we absolutely believe that education is in our DNA. It's one of our core values. Um, and we've been committed to supporting HBCUs for quite, quite a while. Uh, one of the programs that we are very excited about and happy to be working with Dr. Glenda Glover at Tennessee State University is the HBCU C-Square program. And C-Square stands for Code and Create. And so at Apple, we're, we believe every person should have access to coding and technology. And we, we would love to have every student um, take part in coding curriculum and kind of feeding that pipeline for STEM. And so with the C2 program, it really is a hub of innovation for coding. Um, and through Tennessee State University, which serves as that hub, they're servicing all 100 universities. So you can think of the C2 program as being, you know, the hub for how you bring coding to your institutions, through your faculty, through your students, and building your pipeline for future careers. And so um, we're so grateful for that partnership and the scale that we have um, under Dr. Glover's leadership and Dr. Robbie Melton. Um, and we've been able to um, create courses that TSU makes available using the programs that have been created at Apple, the Everyone Can Code program, the Everyone Can Create program, the Apple Teacher program, all of that curriculum creates a way for us to work with TSU to create those courses that they can make available to the other universities. And then the other universities can also create their own courses. So you're seeing that, that filter through the hub institution throughout all of the 46 and growing institutions, really in an effort to, to build that pipeline for future STEM careers. Um, so at Apple, just it's, it's the core of what we do. We believe in it um, very much. and. Um, grateful for that partnership that we have with CSU. Fantastic, thank you for sharing. We'll continue down the line. Sure, at IBM we've been working with HBCUs for decades. Uh, we've been hiring black talent and black executives. I think we may have been the first corporation to do that in the United States. I don't wanna stretch the truth, but I know that we've been, uh, as I've traveled around, I've had the opportunity to meet people who say if it hadn't been for IBM, my family as a black family would not be in the middle class. And we're continuing that commitment. Uh, most recently, we announced that we are working with 20 HBCUs to establish cybersecurity leadership centers. Those centers are receiving professional development for professors, immersive experiences for students, the same experiences that we provide for our clients. They're receiving um, <clears throat> curriculum, and they're also receiving access to our software that's cloud-based. So what we're doing is working with each one to provide a custom designed partnership that's a multi-year partnership where we're building capacity in the departments for them to continue to develop top talent for the future, to work directly with students through mentors and experiences, and also to design majors, minors, and courses of study with our experts. That allows us to have a, a, a long, um, impact far beyond just us working with these individual institutions, but also with their students. Um, some of these are online opportunities, some of them are in person. They have the opportunity to interact with our cybersecurity experts and participate in our cyber range, which is where they experience uh, simulated cybersecurity attacks and how to address them. We're preparing students to with all of the tools that they would need to be an expert today so that they're prepared for jobs when they come out. Uh, it's not just theory, they'll have some practice that they also walk away with. That's fantastic, thank you for sharing and finally. Uh, so I know we're gonna have an opportunity to talk a little bit about curriculum investments. Um, so I'd actually like to talk a little bit about some of our cultural activations Finally. because I do think for McDonald's, it is a business imperative really that we are um, always in and of the community and that we remain um, um, committed and closest to the communities um, in which we serve. And so um, as a result of that business imperative, we've had a strong presence at HBCUs for many years, um, you know, beyond uh, um, the recruitment space. Um, but I know we're gonna talk a little bit about that as well. But in terms of kind of some of the cultural activations, this is a space where really our operators have led for such a long time. Um, showing up in relevant and authentic ways um, in their respective markets. 
But then us as a corporation, we've been thinking about, well, you know, what is our role um, in connecting uh, uh, it, it, the uh, students that are at the HBCUs to the opportunities at the center? And so part of that has been just consistently showing up and being present and being innovative and thinking about how we meet the moment. A couple of the um, most recent cultural activations that we're really excited about um, include uh, featuring uh, Shaw University in our latest brand trust spot. It was such a win-win because -win it um, allowed uh, the opportunity to showcase Shaw University. McDonald's had the benefit of being connected to the university and also was able to pay them for the contribution of being in, in our spotlight. Additionally, we're um, trying to, again, evolve to meet the moment. We're holding our first ever HBCU e-gaming competition where students will come together um, and game for a chance to win uh, $15,000 scholarships. Um, we're also uh, uh, just recently this year doing a uh, gospel competition uh, where uh, the university students will have a chance to sing a song and members of the community and industry insiders will get to vote so everyone here will have a chance to vote and that's uh, that choir will win $75,000 for their institution um, and so again it's just continuing to find ways to connect with the students as a way to open the door to introduce them to all of the possibilities uh, that uh, are available, you know, through a career at McDonald's. But first, you got to be in the room and gain the trust. Well, thank you for sharing that. I think it's important to note the the diversity of the offerings, right? Because as corporations, while we are laser focused on attracting talent to our organizations, we are also just wholly committed to the young men and women coming through these institutions. So through all the programs you all have represented, whether they're coming through our organizations or they're going elsewhere, it's really creating that investment in these young men and women so that they can thrive professionally once they get out, uh, get out into the real world. So thank you for sharing that. Um, going into a little bit more detail, in the previous panel, we talked a lot about the infrastructure. And while we all you know, love our historic buildings and infrastructure, obviously, you, candidly, uh, HBCUs are competing with the modernization of uh, you know these the majority universities and institutions. So that being said, for Accenture and Apple, specifically honing in on you, Chloe and Corey, Corey um, can you speak a little bit more to the importance of updating the digital infrastructure? Because we've talked a lot about the physical, but the digital is just important. You've already alluded to some of that in your previous remarks, but what does that look like in practice for your organizations, and how are you all sort of implementing that across HBCUs? Um, yeah, um, it, it, I was here at HBCU Week last week and had the opportunity to hear from many of the HBCU presidents around the physical infrastructure. Um, and, and I understand the priorities around, you know, building new construction um, and ensuring that they're marketing their university so that students can come and, and receive a great, you know, education um, and be technologically kind of up, updated. Um, there's the deferred maintenance discussion around, you know, bringing up buildings and bringing them to standard. And so all of these decisions and trade-offs that they have to make, um, these things need to, you know, be in place. And then there's conversations around broadband and ensuring that once the technology shows up, is it able to be used properly by the faculty and by the students. And so Apple's absolutely committed to that and has been committed for a very long time. Through our community education initiatives team, that's what we do. Um, we provide devices to our HBCU institutions. Um, we also provide systems engineers for HBCU institutions so that they can be consulted on using the technology on campus and working with their, um, their uh, university IT departments um, once those devices show up on campus. We also have a plethora of Apple professional learning specialists that are former educators, former superintendents, principals, teachers in the classroom that come and talk to the students and faculty about how to use the product if they're unaware, um, but also how to use it in the classroom, what students are doing it, what doing with it, what they're creating um, is extremely important. Um, it's not just about the device, it's also how they're using the device and how they're creating um, things um, for themselves and you know for, for the future. Um, and so I think all of those things have to be in place. Uh, we also provide devices for labs, and so it, it would be highly likely you walk on an HBCU campus, see a, a lab where Apple devices are there. Um, and so we work very closely with those HBCUs to make sure that they have um, the correct technology and updated technology. That's fantastic. It's great to see, especially as Apple being a leader in the tech space. So I just want to say that we can't do enough. There is so much that we can, that support needed 
for HBCUs. So when you talk about just improving the digital infrastructure, the technology infrastructure, the infrastructure in general, there is so much work that needs to be done. And so we're just at the very beginning. I mean, I can brag about the things that we've done, but I really feel like together we can do more. And so I'm looking forward to collaborating and continuing to collaborate with other companies. So if I go a little deeper on what we did, we started with um, the HBCUs in Atlanta to put together a tech modernization plan. And in doing that, we realized that there are shared services and there's a playbook that other HBCUs could use. And so how do we really take whatever learnings we have, not just from the HBCs we're working with, but from you know the, our best thinking from all universities that we work with to really create a playbook and a shared services plan that others can use. Students need the, the basics. They need to be able to get onto the internet, register easily, take their classes, do the work just like at any other university. And so the more we can do to support them, the happier we are because we know that that is better for all of us. I mean, this equity, economic mobility and equity, you know, fuel innovation. And I, I appreciate that, Chloe, because I think collectively, when you think about corporations, like some of us could be competitors on this stage, right? But when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion, we're not. Because it's, I mean, I was just talking to Ebony from Bank of America, and we are literally competitors right next door to each other in Charlotte. <laughs> we were saying, let's get together and let's figure out how we can drive greater impact using our power and our force. So Amen. that's what it's about. Amen. So I commend all of you, and let's continue those partnerships for sure. So now McDonald's and IBM, sort of thinking about your respective companies, um, you've made investments, I know you alluded to this, as far as bringing sort of industry-specific coursework to HBCUs, which is important because as we think about sort of the pathway to career avenues, we want to make sure that all of our young men and women coming out of HBCUs are equipped and ready to enter into the, the corporate workforce, right? So can you talk a little bit more about the work that you've done and what the intended impact has been and how you're hoping, how you're already seeing this impact and how you're hoping to see that impact trickle into the workforce over time. Sure, I'm free to take a start. Um, many people don't know this, but McDonald's does tons of work in the real estate development space. Uh, so there's lots of opportunity for employment, both you know, uh, scouting new locations for restaurants, um, building our new restaurants, and retrofitting and updating our, our existing restaurants. And our real estate development team um, has opportunities all across the country and uh, are looking to fill that pipeline you know, with diverse talent. And they noticed fairly quickly that um, it didn't seem sufficient to just show up at schools and recruit, right? That wasn't gonna help uh, fully meet the need. Um, and so one example uh, that, that really came from the real estate development team themselves was let's figure out how we can partner with schools, with HBCUs in the areas where we have quite a bit of work and become an integral partner to those institutions. And one way that that has shown itself um, is in a, a newer partnership with North um, Carolina Central University where we have a member of our real estate development leadership sitting on the board of advisors. We have members of our uh, real estate development leadership serving as mentors and sponsors to the graduate um, students. And then we're also helping stand up a, an MBA program specific with, uh, specifically with a real estate focus. Um, and again, the intended outcome of that and partnerships like that, you know, that we have in schools across the country um, is certainly to help, you know, feed our pipeline, but to help feed the entire pipeline, um, whether it's QSR or construction or real estate. Um, and I do think as we think about what the future of partnership with HBCUs looks like, it has to be um, more innovative and true, truly partners um, versus being transactional. Again, we absolutely should continue with the scholarships and cutting the checks, and that, that needs to continue to happen, but how do we evolve to meet the moment uh, to continue to, to strive to be true partners? I appreciate that. I think partnership's so important. It's not just about cutting the check, because anybody can do that. We want to do that, but we also want to continue that sort of deeper and, and more intimate investment, so thank you for sharing that. IBM. Sure. So last year, the White House had a cybersecurity summit, and it was made clear to all of us, there was a call to action, that we needed to solve the shortage of the cybersecurity talent in the United States that the shortage is over 500,000 jobs and, and up to 700,000, depending on which resource you're looking at. 
our, in, our research institute did a study and learned that uh, organizations that say they have prepared cybersecurity staff are $550,000 better off in addressing a breach than those that don't. By our work with HBCUs, particularly around cybersecurity, this is putting HBCUs at the center of solving a national crisis. So it is not just you know, goodwill, it is beyond what we've seen in the last uh, few years, the response to terrible acts that we know have happened in America over time and will hopefully won't happen again, but this is making sure that HBCUs are part of a story to solve a national crisis in talent, in national security, in the next generation of technology talent, and IBM is doing our part to put our most current cutting edge resources, experts, and other offerings on the table and making that happen. I love that, and I think too, it's it just a great sort of um, introduction into corporate America, right? Because I think there, there's so many, you can go to recruitment fairs, there are a lot of organizations that are just trying to appeal to the students, but this is sort of real time investment where they can sort of see what the companies are doing and the value that they could bring as a potential employee at some point in time. So thank you for sharing that. Um, so collectively, you all have talked about a lot of great examples of your engagement with HBCUs, going beyond just financial investment and really focusing on that more structured partnership. Can you give examples of you know, how students have reacted to some of the things that you've done, and specifically how you've seen those part what, what's come out of those partnerships and that really matriculate into an employment relationship with some of these students that you've been involved with? And anybody's free to respond. Sure. One of the things that we offer are digital credentials, and those can be integrated into the coursework with HBCUs. They can be integrated into any uh, coursework anywhere, but what we've learned, and particularly for students at HBCUs who might not have the social network where they can pick up the phone and call their parent's friend and get a job, these credentials help them to show what they know and are able to do. And we're seeing, and I, I talked to a couple of deans last week during HBCU week, who said our students are getting internships because they have IBM credentials. They are able to talk about what they know and they're able to do because they've participated in these immersive experiences. They've participated in what we call capture the flag events. They have talked to cybersecurity experts at IBM and they understand the value of these jobs and the career opportunities for them. So while our newest partnerships are just kicking off, the relationships that we have with HBCUs and what we've been able to offer them as part of upgrading the curriculum and making sure students have access, we're seeing the results from that already. That's fantastic and that's so critical because it's just, again, that real life experience, practical experience and we often hear that it's hard for our HBCU students to compete, right? Because they're often just not recognized as they should be, but they're, they're top talent. And, and having those credentials even further sort of allow them to move to the front and be ex get that exposure that they're entitled to and that they deserve. Anyone else want to share? Well, we do similar to IBM. We do the same at Accenture. We offer credentials. We, um, our interns get a chance to really partner on projects with our experts. Um, so I'm really proud of what collectively we're doing. I would say that the other thing I'm really proud of is just our HBCU grads at Accenture. I mean, that HBCU pride is real. Absolutely. And so we have a pack house that has, our um, HBCU graduates have formed, where they just come together and they support graduates coming in. Like, we invest, but they invest their time, their talent to make sure that the HBCU graduates have access and exposure to mentoring, um, we as leaders provide sponsorship and we just make sure that we put our arms around them because coming into the workforce is a little different than being in college and we realize that we have to maybe put a little extra love around our students and make sure that they have the support they need to make that transition and you asked what is the experience of the students, they're loving it. Which is awesome and they're not <laughs> only loving it but because you're wrapping your arms around them they're going to pay that forward so as the next cycle of students comes it's just going to you and you're going to keep building that momentum and you're going to be known as these institutions that you know, create and admire a fostering and supportive environment for these students, which is awesome. I'm so glad you said that because that is one thing that I have seen is an investment in, in one of our students, in, in H, all of our people of color, but in HBCU students, they always they pay it forward. Absolutely. And so um, 
I know that generationally, it also supports economic mobility as well. Absolutely, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, as, as a fourth gener generation HBCU grad, it's an absolute imperative uh, for me to do pay it forward Absolutely. in terms of the work that we that we do at Apple and how we work as a team to you know commit and support our HBCU students. So I look at my grandmother's grad, uh, 1907 diploma every single day when I sit down to work, and it just fuels um, the work that I do That's every day. Awesome. Thank, awesome. You. Awesome. Thank you. Thank um, you. At Apple, we hear a lot about the projects that they're working on. And so it kind of speaks to, Chloe, what you were saying around the experiences that they have. But they're actually engaging in projects that they can actually see out there that uh, out there in the world and that other uh, individuals are interacting with. They say, I worked on that. I did that. Um, and that really helps them when they are looking for employment, whether they decide to join Apple or not. Um, what I hear most often is just the projects and, and the people and all that they're able to accomplish while they're while they're at Apple. Same as you, Chloe, we have um, many HBC graduates at Apple that lean in to support, that mentor our students, um, not just during the internship, but after the internship. So I'm in touch with several of my mentees over the years, and we just maintain that connection, and they're off doing wonderful things. Um, but we don't see it as you're just here for this period of time and the relationship is over. We continue to hold them and nurture them and, and see them through their career journey. So. Um, one of the things I'm super proud of is our founding, we're founding uh, members of the Propel Center. Um, and that's the, the innovation hub that will be in Atlanta, but really excited about what we're going to see coming from that. Um, and one of our students who was an intern came from Howard University, her name is Mia Moore, um, and she applied her creativity skills and, and created her own version of Beats headphones. Um, we're kind of wow. reflecting our culture. Um, and using the Pan-African flag on those Beats headphones. And can I tell you the response that she received, the job offer she received, come work for me, come work, we tried to keep her at Apple. Uh, but uh, she went off to do wealth, right? amazing things. Um, but that's just an example of just the actual products that, that many out there love Apple products and that they just get to say, I did that. And so that's what we hear most often. That's, that's phenomenal. And again, the investment just in the student versus it would be nice to have that student come to Apple, but you were just investing that student so that they can prosper and thrive, and that's fantastic. Any other examples? Yeah, I mean, si similarly, I think some of our newer initiatives, you know, we're are still waiting to, to reap the benefits of the increase in, in applicants, for example, with that um, MBA um, real estate component. But I will tell you that we have... Um, had such a strong recruiting presence at HBCUs for a long time and have always had the benefit of um, a lot of eagerness around working for our brand um, from HBCU grads. But what's been really meaningful to me, especially since I've been enrolled, is to see um, so many of that kind of entry level talent coming in and then directly working on the projects that impact how we show up at their college or at another college, um, kind of getting getting that direct impact and that hands-on work as soon as they come in the door. And that pride is pride that they carry with them for um, through the halls um, and, and as they engage with, with our leaders, you know, many of whom also are HBCU grads. So it, it is really um, a wonderful kind of life cycle of our investment kind of coming back to us, you know, really two and threefold. That's awesome. There's HBCU pride everywhere. So we've had a great discussion, and we thank you all for your attention. Before we wrap up, yeah. I just want to sort of give some party words. So we have... HBCU presidents here, we have students here, likely we have corporations here. If you all could sort of give us all a charge, right? So Chloe, you said we've got it, we can do more. We are already doing a lot, but we can do a lot, lot more. What's the, like, what do you charge all of us to do, no matter what capacity we're in, to keep the momentum going and to make sure that we continue to drive these efforts forward? Collaborate so we can continue to innovate. Absolutely, collaborate so we can continue to innovate. I say uh, stay accountable. Accountability, I love it. I'm going to go also with collaborate because we have prepared students not just for jobs at IBM but for anywhere in the tech sector and a lot of the content that we have on our foundational offering is from our clients. Absolutely. So Adobe I think was here early, we've had others and we've found that students really hold on to that and they try a little bit of everything and they're prepared for the next thing even if it isn't a job in tech. Mm -hmm. 
Similar to that, you know, I had a couple of conversations before the panel started, and I know that corporations are in different places and different parts of their journey. And so don't be intimidated by the fact that maybe there is not a large budget um, for you at the moment to show up and activate um, how you want to, but think about how you make the most of what you already have. I think about, similar to you, we had a job skills training program that wasn't developed intentionally for HBCU uh, students, but during the pandemic, we were thinking, gosh, how do we show up in this moment? Right. And, um, and, you know, pivoting just a little bit to create greater access to that curricula, we were able to leverage it for um, incoming freshman HBCU students who were learning remotely in a pandemic and you know, could benefit from all of that job skills um, curriculum. So that was something that wasn't a heavy financial lift for us, but it, it required us to be creative and think about what we already have and how we can leverage it for greater impact. I love that. So to summarize, I mean, there's room for everyone, right? Let's exercise our creativity, let's collaborate, and let's challenge each other to be accountable and continue to drive that impact. So ladies, thank you oh, thank for a great you. panel. Thank you <laughs> thank all you. of you for thank being you. here. And we will close out on that high note. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay, with that, thank you all so much for coming. Um, we're gonna turn it over to the audience if they have questions for our panelists. Um, we're gonna use the house microphones that are located on either aisle, so if you have questions, please um, make your way there. We can, I think, take around two to three, um, and then we'll make sure to call up the appropriate panelists if you direct your question accordingly. So I have a question. Um, well, obviously I'm up here. Um, so how do we feel? So you said there's a, uh, a 500,000 job security gap. Well, in, in, in cybersecurity, how do we go about filling in that gap? Because if we think about uh, how far behind, especially in the black community, uh, when it comes to uh, STEM education, how do we go about mobilizing one, our education, investing in our education system, and then mobilizing those students who then go into STEM to go into cybersecurity. I come to the mic to answer the question. I think it's important to note that not all of these jobs require a four-year degree. And I think one thing we can all do is make sure that students know that, or people know that. Because if you think you first need the four-year degree, you will give up before you start. There are plenty of cybersecurity analyst jobs and data analyst jobs and threat analyst jobs that start out before a four-year degree. I mean, I've, one of the things that I heard from the deans last week is their top students are getting recruited into jobs before they graduate. So there's, there are lots of training opportunities that may be six months, they may be a year but they can prepare people for an entry level job. Now, I'm not gonna, you do need some foundational skills, but you don't necessarily need a four year job, four year degree for all of those jobs that are out there. I think the other thing is to make sure, right, we, people need to know where the jobs are. They need to know about CyberSeq. They need to know that IBM has free training programs. Everything we're offering in this training that I talked about is free. We have some that are through, you know, much deeper partnerships with the 20 HBCUs, but we also have through Skills Build and through our corporate social responsibility programs, free training for anyone. And so I think it's important for people to understand where the opportunity is and know that there are jobs out there. Because I do think in, a, in an economic, uh, in a period of, sh you know, a shrinking economy, People need to know where to put their time and their energy to get jobs that will give them good paying, uh, you know, living wage jobs. I just want to add to that um, because collectively, again, over half of our entry level jobs are being filled by apprentices. So people don't need four year degrees. We're partnering 
um, with some of our partners in the communities to be able to create those opportunities through certificates um, and allow people to get real life experiences. And our apprentices are a big part of our program. So that's one thing. Um, but if, as you think about it, we've got, um, you know, with the CDCF, CDCF we had a um, fellow last year in cybersecurity, but that's only one. So we've got to, again, try to make more opportunity for people that don't have four-year degrees and for those that do have four-year degrees. And part of that, and you'll see through our collaboration, we all ran off the stage together and said, how are we going to collaborate more? Well, that's what we're going to do, because we want to make sure that we're providing opportunity. It just makes sense, not only for our companies, but for the country. Well, I want to thank my colleagues, because, of course, there are so many uh, opportunities in cybersecurity right now. Uh, one of the things that Virginia State University is doing is we have made it now at Virginia State where if you're looking to major in computer science or computer engineering, that you can come to Virginia State University for free. We steered almost all of our scholarship money towards computing because we know that that's where we can make a difference and where young people can make a difference. Uh, and while we believe certainly that there's a diversity um, of, of ways to get into cybersecurity and get into computing and there's there's ways to get in from community college, from high school, and before you come to college. Of course, at a university, we highly recommend that, that people go and get the four-year degree. And we believe that it is really worth it uh, to do just that. Uh, as a parent, uh, my daughter is now in computing, in cybersecurity. She is finishing up her master's degree now. And she is making an ungodly amount of money uh, doing the work that she's doing right now. Uh, she makes more than 90% of the people who work at Virginia State University in her first position. And so I think one of the things that's really important is that one, that we work hard to produce as HBCUs, and all of my colleagues are doing the same thing, really concentrating on computer science, computer engineering, and cybersecurity, but also letting our young people know that the way to maximize your value, right, is to get the credentials that you need to be able to do that. Thank you. Do we have other questions? Okay, well with that, it's my honor and pleasure to bring up Dr. Dietra Trent with the White House Initiative on HBCUs. You may take your spot at the podium, ma'am. Thank you. Good afternoon, good evening. I don't even know what time it is. Good afternoon. Um, I want to just, first of all, thank Representative Adams um, for inviting me to participate in today's discussion. And um, thank her. She has been a warrior uh, and a lifelong devotion to empowering and equipping our HBCUs. And so um, I don't know if she's still here, but I do want to extend my deep appreciation for all that she does on our behalf. Um, I also want to thank our presidents. Um, these, these, these people here, they are the most committed, the most innovative, and transformational leaders, not just among HBCUs, but among higher ed writ large. These folks, exactly. <laughs> these folks are raising a bar like none other. They understand the moment we are in, and they are turning this moment into a movement and combining it with our legacy and producing in extraordinary ways. So it's such an honor for me to work with you and for you, and thank you for all that you do. And finally, I want to thank our corporate sponsors. We could not do what we do without your commitment and belief in our institutions. Um, the value of your support goes way beyond monetary means, and it, it, you help us to magnify the excellence within our universities, and we are deeply appreciative for all that you do. I would say that if ever there was a best of times and worst of times scenario for HBCUs, I think we're in that moment. On the one hand, in the aftermath of George Floyd's murder, Millions of philanthropic dollars have been contributed to our institutions. The Biden-Harris administration, along with our 
our congressional partners have delivered nearly six billion to HBCUs in less than two years. And that's more than any other administration ever. And thanks to our chief patron and, and the godmother of, of uh, HBCUs, Representative Adams, the HBCU Partners Act was passed two years ago. And it's really delivering game-changing way, it delivering in game-changing ways. Um, for an example, the Air Force recently announced the first ever HBCU-led university affiliated research center. This is historic. It's a $60 million investment over five years. These HBCUs will be doing research in tactical autonomy, and that's a game changer for us. This summer, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency brought in researchers from five HBCUs to conduct research alongside the NGA scientists on real world issues. These faculty will take their best practices and that new knowledge back on their campuses. And that, again, is a game changer for us. And finally, there are a number of federal agencies now that are requiring DEI plans for some of the proposals that they are funding. Again, a game changer. On the other hand, it is clear, as we've talked about today, that HBCUs continue to have challenges. We talked about the bomb threats and other acts of terror today. We are challenged by our infrastructure needs whether we define it by the physical buildings, the technology, or people. We are challenged by lack of funding and lack of investments. We are challenged by our students' challenges. And we are challenged by the continued impact of racism and discrimination. So our challenges indeed persist. But I am inspired by the fact that there seems to be a better understanding for the essential need to address infrastructure at all levels whether it is establishing a program like the Air Force did, providing HBCUs with opportunities to receive hands-on training like um, NGA, developing an inclusive environment with DEI plans, or even the 450 million that President Biden put in his FY23 budget to create greater research capacity at HBCUs, MSIs, and TCCs. We are beginning to see a deeper appreciation for the infrastructure challenges that our institutions face. Representative um, Adams um, has really helped us to change the narrative around HBCUs. Um, we are not just institutions with great need, we are institutions of great pride and great resiliency. And we are institutions with a legacy of excellence. And despite our needs, we deliver over and over and over again. So I'll just close with this. As a nation, I believe it is critical for us to not only understand the value and strength in our diversity, but we must also act upon it. Doing nothing less places us at a disadvantage in overall competitiveness, innovation, and even in national security. We must continue to invest in our HBCUs, and when we do, we invest in our future. So again, I want to thank you. Thank you so much again for coming. With that, this concludes HBCU Stronger. I hope you all take something away from today's discussion. I am going to call our panelists back up so we can get some photos. Um, but thank you all so much again for coming, and I'm sure some of us will stick around if you have additional questions.